I wanted to start by first dedicating this to a very special uh, woman who passed away last month. Uh, Dr. Stuart Kaplan of Kew Gardens Hills taught me first to chant the Torah and then the Nevi'im and then the Kethuvim. Uh, he trained me to, for my bar mitzvah. I read uh, Parshaf Bishalach according to the regular cycle. Uh, as Rambam says, the Minhag Pashut, where they finish the Torah once, a, once every year. And then he told me to read the Haftar, of course. And it was very successful. Uh, a number of neighbors bought for me, for my bar mitzvah, a copy of Megillah Thester, the, the actual Megillah, uh, written on cloth. I guess their hope was, I did well learning how to read the Torah. So, and I guess they, they wanted me to also read the Megillah for them. And I stayed on with Dr. Kaplan learning, learning the Megillah. And it was due to his wife's Messiris Nefesh and allowing him all the time to be with me that I was able to do it. And now uh, not, uh, a Purim has not gone by without me reading the Megillah quite a few times. And of course, always later in the day be, for all those people who, oh man, I just missed it. And including Arab Shabbos, it happens that we read, have to read the Megillah. So that was successful. And uh, Mrs. Kaplan uh, tragically passed away just uh, last month. It was very sad. So I'd like to give my, once again, my condolences to their family and her children and thank Dr. Kaplan and uh, her for their uh, sacrifice. Uh, next, uh, we left off last time I did this. I said that we're going to see some examples of uh, what the Rav calls Torah Eretz Yisrael. One good example that is not relevant today, it's not in Yon Adioma, but God willing, perhaps uh, in a few months when Yom Kippur rolls around, we could discuss it more in depth. Most are familiar with the Shulchan Aruch's ruling regarding washing the hands on the morning of Yom Kippur, that you, you wash the fingers only up to a certain point. That is based on Rabbeinu Tam's understanding that there is a dispensation for washing the hands in Yom Kippur. What is forbidden is washing out of pleasure. But if one's hands are soiled, let's say one were to get mud all over his hands, uh, that is allowed. So Rabbeinu Tam argues that the evil spirit or the whatever it is that is upon the hands upon waking in the morning, the thing that we cannot tell about, we, we, we can't discern it, but apparently it is, is a harmful entity on the hands, may be removed through Nitilaf Yadayim, the morning of Yom Kippur, uh, to a certain extent. So that's why he allows the Nitilaf Yadayim then. And that is what you find in the Shulchan Aruch. Rav Tzuri already said, Make sure you have mnemonic devices to remember where to find this. So this one has an easy mnemonic device. It's an orachayim. That's a section of the Shulchan Aruch. Siman Taryag, 613. 613b to be exact. So it's an easy one to remember. That's where he allows for this. But then you see that the Vilna Gon disagrees. The Vilna Gon cites, for example, uh, the implication of Rambam's Psak that all hand washing is strictly forbidden. He does not allow for this dispensation. And the Vilna Gon actually says that this is the clear reading of the Rishami uh, in Brachoth 2.7. And then he says, V'cheni kar. So this is a perfect example of uh, Torah Eretz Yisrael. You have a classic psaq of the Shulchan Aruch with which everybody is mostly familiar. It's a very common psaq. Yet you find that the Vilna Gon disagrees. The Vilna Gon shows that Rambam disagrees. The Vilna Gon shows that the precedent is in the Talmud Yerushalmi, and he rules that way. And it also shows, uh, I guess, a more rationalist, even though the Rambam is, uh, the Vilna Gon isn't exactly as much of a rationalist as the Rambam, but still, this is more of the rationalist approach as opposed to the non-rationalist approach of the Tosafists. So this is what an example. Like I said, we can get into that sometime later, but it was uh, something that I know people were asking for. And there you have it. And there's uh, quite a few more examples, God willing, we'll be able to discuss afterwards. Uh, next one. Uh, we have to begin with this week's parasha. Uh, according to the three-year cycle, we're going to be reading Hukothai, uh, which was actually read according to the more common practice, the one-year cycle uh, around the world just this last week. So it's a good coincidence. And by coincidence, I don't mean that's just the way it is. I mean, it's the two events are coinciding. We will be reading it this week, and everybody read it last week. So uh, in order to keep up with Armin Hug, we're going to speak about some dikduk. The word behukothai, as it appears in the Torah, written, has no vavs in it. And some say, where are the vavs? Where are the vavs? When they write it without nikud, they would write it bet, chet, vav, kuf, 
Vav, Tav, Yud. Sometimes you even add a Yud after that first Yud, so you don't you would know to read it with a Patach and not a Chirik at the end. But really, there should not be any Vavs in that word. Uh, one of the amazing things you find in the Torah, for example, is that often that Vav before the Tav indicating a feminine uh, plural, that's a, a, it's a suffix indicating the feminine plural usually pronounced oath, uh, does not need to be written full with the, with the Vav indicating the vowel, uh, especially when there is something subsequent to that that indicates the plural. So often you have the Yud itself, the Yud indicates the plural, the Yud, the plural possessive is indicated by the Yud. So you have the word Toro Tai, which, sorry, I didn't pronounce the tough weekly, but I'm trying to you know, stay, on, stay on course here. Most people know how to, how to that they, when I, they hear me say the word Toro Tai, they can spell it out. They see the tough and the Rash and the tough. Because Toro Tai is referring to my Torahs, the Torahs is already plural. It's pluralized by that Yud, or the word Toro Tav, his Torahs, would be pluralized by the Yud Vav, then we do not need to have the Vav after the Rash uh, signifying the Torot part. It's sufficient that there is a Tav there indicating that the vowel before the Tav would be a Chulam. More importantly, the word Bechukothai has no, uh, the, the Shuruk, there is no Shuruk there. Some people think you could spell the Shuruk and uh, fill the Vav before the, before, before the Kuf and after the Chet. That's not true. It's a, really a Kibbutz. The Kibbutz is fundamentally different than the Shuruk. The Kibbutz is one of the shorter vowels. If I used to like to say in American English, the shuruk is the long oo sound as in food, whereas the kibbutz is closer to the short uh, oo sound in good, good food. In American English, you could hear there's a difference. In, in uh, Tiberian Hebrew, Masoretic Hebrew, there's, the kibbutz is supposed to be a shorter vowel. And according to the, at least the, the diktuk that's popular among the Rishon that we follow and the Vilna Gon, uh, it's, it, the kibbutz only truly appears in closed, unaccented syllables. And there are exceptions, but that's a general rule to find the kamatz katan, which, by the way, is very questionable if it should be pronounced any different than a regular kamatz. But at least for our grammatical constructs, the kamatz katan, chirik katan, and kibbutz only occur in closed, unaccented syllables. Like in the word chanduka or suka, really, all those words don't have vavs because all of them have kibbutzes in closed, unaccented syllables. The thing that closes the syllable is the geminated uh, consonant that has the dagesh after the kibbutz. So in sukkah, the kibbutz is in the, under the samich, and then the kaf always has a dagesh indicating a missing letter of the shoresh. By the way, what's the missing letter of the shoresh sukkah? It's the kaf, another kaf, like from the word schach. So that, that, that compensates for it. So in the word bahukothai, you have a kibbutz and a dot in the kuf, uh, a dagesh chazak in the kuf, indicating that there's a letter of the shoresh missing and the vowel before the, the kuf is uh, weakened. It's one of the inherently short vowels. So this actually happens with a number of uh, nouns that have this uh, feature. We would call them, sometimes they call them the, the kfulim. That is the noun consists, uh, the shoresh of the noun, its second letter and its third letter are identical. And when you make a noun out of that shoresh, you just have one cholam indicating, uh, one cholam vowelizing the single syllable that is the word. So from the word dovev, which is like a type of speaking, dalit bet bet, you have the word dove, which is a bear. And dove is vowelized with a cholam and it's written with a cholam chaser. That is, you don't write a vav when you spell the word dove. And the plural, or the constructs you can build from the word dov. For example, the plural of dov is not dovot or dovim, it's dubim with a shuruk. So in those cases, you geminate the, the, the second letter, indicating that in this construct, we're missing the, second, uh, the third letter of the shoresh. And you can take another example, chokek is uh, to legislate or to make laws. That's the shoresh of the word chok. So chok is always written Chaser, it's just chet kuf. There's supposed to be a second letter chet to that uh, uh, as representing the shoresh. And that's why in the plurals and the constructs from the word chok, uh, you always have a shuruk or a kamatz katan. So chukothai would be my 
uh, enactments. That's what God's referring to. So there's a kubutz there and a dagesh the kuf. And you also have in these words, when they're connected to the next word in a construct, for example, an eternal chok is chok olam. I remember there was a fellow who pronounced it chak olam. He was pronouncing, he would pronounce his kamats exactly like a patach, which is unfortunately uh, how they do it in many styles. That's modern Hebrew and uh, certain forms of what they call Sephardic Hebrew, although I don't like using that term. They don't make a distinction between the patach and the kamats. So then they see that the word chok with a hyphen, which is called a, a, a makaf or a makaf, depending on which, also which book you're looking in. When it connects to the next word, it's a eternal chok. So they, it's written with a kamats. Uh, it should be pronounced like a kamats, not like a patach. So that's chok olam. And another word you have is oz, ayin zayin, which, by the way, we mentioned Rav Tzuriel, the other mnemonic for remembering where Rabbeinu Tom's shita regarding his opinion regarding washing the hands on Yom Kippur is right there in Yoma, Ayin Zayin, Amud Bet. So that's a, that's a second mnemonic. Oz is from the Shoresh Ayin Zayin Zayin that occurs in, for example, Azuz no Rothecha Yomeru. So when you have the word Oz in a construct form, it's Uzi, God is my, my might, and Uzichem, uh, or Ozi Vizim Ya. Uh, in all these constructs, the cholam turns into a kamatz katan or a shuruk, and there's a dot in the zayin. And another similar shoresh would be kol, uh, from the word kalal. Kaf lamid lamid is the true shoresh. So the word kol, which is normally in, on itself, has a cholam when it's connected to the next word, or when it's in a construct state, or it's possessive, it always has a kamatz katan or a kubutz. So how do you say all of us? It's kulanu, with a shuruk, with a kibbutz, and a dot in the lamid. And kol haolam is spelled with a kamatz and not a holam. So there you have it. Whereas opposed to the vowel, the, 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 what do you call it? The, the nouns, which are written from a full shoresh, when the shoresh is completely there and the vav is the middle letter of the shoresh, you have, uh, for example, the word kol, voice, uh, that's spelled with a kuf, and you have the word or with an aleph, meaning light. All those, all those words are spelled with the vav to indicate that the vav is part of the shoresh, and we're not missing a part of the shoresh. And the word oath, meaning sign, the other word ar, meaning skin or leather, tov, shore, meaning ox. In all these examples, the vav stays in the plural forms and most possessive forms and in construct forms, the vav is part of the shoresh. And the same applies to uh, words which have the aleph as the middle of the shorish, and you form nouns like that, those nouns are more related to the segulet nouns. Examples include the word rosh, meaning head, and zot, which is the feminine form of ze, this, and nod, meaning, uh, let's say, a, a, they used to use a, the old-fashioned uh, water skins. All those examples, the aleph is there, it's part of the shorish, and the vowel stays full. So if you have your head, it's called roshi. You don't say Rashi with a kamatz and then put a dagesh in the shin. Uh, so that's that's enough for the dikduk. Just explain the first word of the par uh, with the second word in the parsha in behukothai. Now we understand why it is that there's no vav in behukothai and why there is a dagesh there and how it should be properly pronounced. Uh, why are we reading this now? The Mishnah uh, at the end. Well, it depends on if you're following the bavi over the Yushalmi. There's a switcheroo going on. What is the third chapter in the Mishnayot and in the Bavli of Megillah becomes the fourth chapter in at least our printed versions of the Bavli. So if you finish studying Megillah, you'll get to the sugya, which says that we are supposed to read the Klaloth in uh, Torah Kohanim around now, before the holiday of Shavuot, of Pentecost. And I remember when I started studying this issue in depth about five years ago, uh, and it occurred to me that even though you see, for example, that uh, is the Maharsha or Maharshal, what does it sound here? I don't want to. I don't want to confuse the two. Uh, it was um, it was the Maharsha, for example, and the Tosafists deal with how we fit in the readings of the Chukothai and Kitavo. Kitavo has the Tochacha, the other curses that they say that those are supposed to be read before the end of the year, before Rosh Hashanah. And those Rishonim discuss how to fit in 
these readings into the common cycle, the one-year cycle. And then I said, oh, but according to the three-year cycle, they couldn't, do, they couldn't possibly fit these in because they only read each of these parashiyoth once every three years as part of the cycle. So it must be that if you're doing a three-year cycle, which, uh, which, which has just been reintroduced now, at least uh, in order so that we can study the parashiyoth more in depth at a slower pace, if the parashiyoth are long, it's hard to study them uh, and give them all the, the proper attention in just a week. If you were doing the, uh, this, this process, this, this practice, if you had this practice of reading the Torah at a much slower rate, you could not get to Behokothai and to Kithavo once every year. Instead, it must be that they would take out the Sefer Torah and not read uh, the regularly scheduled part of the cycle, but instead just read the, the Parsha as it is, the Parsha that we, we are commanded to read or at least uh, that Chazal enacted that we read this week. And I'm very um, happy. This is the first year I realized, so now people are actually going to be doing that. They're going to be studying the Hokothai on its own without getting uh, involved in a, in a cycle, uh, dedicating a whole week just to understanding what it is about on its own. So that was, uh, that was very rewarding. And then I realized that the Gemara's explanation for why doing it is probably not sufficient for our purposes. Why? Uh, the Gemara says that we should end the year and its curses and begin a new year with its blessings. So that makes sense why we read the Tochacha before uh, Rosh Hashanah, because that's the end of the year. But the Gemara itself asks, there is no change of year right now. Perhaps you could make a good argument that Nisan is the beginning of a year and Adar is the end of a year in that respect. After all, Nisan is the first of our months. We have a very strange calendar calendar that we start a year at the seventh month and then do the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, twelfth, possibly thirteenth month, and then start again at the first month, and we're in the same year. But the Gemara wonders, in what sense is Shavuot a new year? And then the Gemara answers by saying that, well, if you look at the first two Mishnayoth in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, you find that there's four uh, Rosh Hashanim. There's four beginnings of the year. There's the year that begins at first of Elul. That's regarding the tides for the, the flocks. Although, if you then see that elsewhere in the Mishnah, in the Choroth, I believe, we see that that's not the accepted opinion of the There's should really only three halachic New Years. Then we have Rosh Hashanah that we commonly call, that's the first of Tishrei. Uh, there's the first of Nisan, which is the Rosh Hashanah for kings. And then there's uh, some, one Rosh Hashanah in Shvat, perhaps it's the first of Shvat, it's the 15th of Shvat, that's also an argument. But sometime in Shvat, that's a new year for the trees. And then the next Mishnah says that the world is judged at four periods of the year. The three Regalim, that's Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot, and uh, on Rosh Hashanah. So it says, basically, the implication is that these four periods of judgment are also like beginnings of years. But the problem is that that's, that's exactly a contradiction to the Mishnah. The Mishnah starts by saying there's four beginnings of the year, and then there's four times when we are judged, and they are not in the same category. They're, four, they're, they're two different subjects, and only one of those days actually falls into both categories. It's like you have the, the two circles, the locus of all points that fall within the two circles. There's a circle that is uh, the category of Rosh Hashanim, New Year's, and then you have this, the circle that is the the, the, the events that are times when we are judged. And only Rosh Hashanah fits into both of those. The implication that Shavuot, even though we are judged on Shavuot, that's when the fruit of the, the, fruit of the trees are judged, that does not mean it's the beginning of a year. So that, that always bothered me for a while until I, I looked into it and I saw that perhaps you could say that the year begins, it's like your wedding anniversary. God, so to speak, is married to the Jewish people, which is a very strange anthropomorphism, but it's used throughout the Torah. The Jewish people represent God's faithful bride, and uh, straying after idols is always uh, uh, analogized to a straying wife. That's the nature of the relationship, and there's a lot of putim. There's a lot of chazal about this. There's a lot of the works of the prophets about this very idea. So you could say that Shavuot is a new year in the sense that it's our anniversary with God. Or, I like to say something that I, I saw in the Mishnah, 
uh, sorry, in the Midrash, I just restarted my computer, so I lost the file over here, added over here, one of the Midrashim on uh, our parasha, I think it's Rabbi Yochanan says that if you look in this week, you'll, saw, you'll see that it doesn't fit with the rest of the book of Vayikra. The book of Vayikra picked up after the construction of the Mishkan. It starts with Vayikra elav Hashem me oho moed lemor. So Moshe Rabin was called from this newly constructed tabernacle. And then we read later in the book about how the events that happened when the Mishkan was first set up. That's the, the inauguration, the, the initiation of the priests, the, the untimely death of Nadav and Avihu. And then there's some more events after that. It says that God spoke to him, Achrimoth, Shnei B'nei Aron. And now we're returning this week's parasha, sorry, or, or, or more like in the reading that we would read before Bihar, uh, before Bechukothai, which says Bihar, that God spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu, Bihar Sinai Lemor, back on Mount Sinai. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't go back to Mount Sinai after he came down with the second Luchoth. He never went back up there uh, after he came down quite a few months before the construction of the tabernacle which means that obviously this book is out of order. We have now, with these last two parashioth in Vayikra, Bahar and Bahukothai, we've returned to the events at Mount Sinai. And I wish I could put it up here, but I'm having a computer problem. It says here in, in the Midrash that this book, this section, Bahar uh, and Bahukothai, which is basically summed up as this is the covenant that God uh, established with the Jewish people on Mount Sinai, this is the re- this is what is referred to as the Sefer Habarith that Moshe Rabbeinu read to the people at Mount Sinai, and as described in at the end of what's commonly known as Parashat Mishpatim. Although even in the olden days they probably called it Parashat in Kesef, like we have in the Sefer Achinuch, and uh, Mishpatim is actually once again we're going to get to that when everybody's reading Mishpatim according to the three-year cycle is actually a number. Of, of readings. So it's the last part of the readings that make up what is commonly known as Mishpatim. That is, this is the new year of the reading, uh, sorry, this is the new year of the enactment of the covenant. When it comes to the reading for the holidays, we already have that in, once again, the same Sugyan Megillah, what are we supposed to read in the holidays? So the Mishnah says on Shavuot, you read a passage from the, the middle of the book of Devarim, which describes the holiday, Shiva Shavuot Tisparlach. And then we know that uh, from the subsequent Gemaras that there is a Brisa which says that actually there are some who read what's more commonly read on Shavuot, and that is the revelation at Sinai from Parashat Yithro, or what's known as Yithro. And in the diaspora, they actually end up reading both. On the first day, they read Yithro, like the people in Eretz Israel now do. And on the second day, they read which uh, Kol Abachor, which includes this Shiva Shavuot parasha, which the Mishnah says to read on Shavuot. But here in Eretz Yisrael, we only have one day, so we have to pick one of those readings. According to the three year cycles put together by Reb Gavriel, uh, we will be reading Shiva Shavuot, whereas uh, most synagogues will be reading the passage once again from Parashat Yithro. And it does make sense that because on Shavuot we enacted this covenant, we should read the actual text of this covenant. It's sort of like reading the, the Ketubah, although that's, that's a very strange practice perhaps that Chazal wouldn't, wouldn't recognize that we do at our wedding, weddings. But in, in preparation for the holiday of Shavuot, it behooves us to read over the conditions of this covenant. And that is what we are reading this week. That's what Bihar is. It's a deal. It, it is the conditions, uh, if we keep the Torah, uh, what we could expect. And what we can also, uh, uh, we should expect if we do not keep the Torah. That's why we are reading it this week. And that's how I think we can resolve what the Gemara means, that we are starting a new year on Shavuot, even though we don't normally consider Shavuot to be a new year in any sense. And that's probably not what the Mishnah said, that we are judged on the new year. Uh, uh, we are judged at the time of Shavuot, not because of the new year, because that's the season of the beginning of the fruits growing on the trees, but for us, it is being the new year, and we should re we should re familiarize ourselves with the words of the covenant that we agreed to at Mount Sinai. And it's very important if you don't keep reminding yourselves of these things, if you don't remind yourselves to keep the mitzvot, then you will have a pretty hard time keeping them. Now let's get into the nitty gritty of the parasha. I think that we should before we can understand what 
Bihar is saying, sorry, what Gothai is saying, what exactly is on the line, we first need to understand what was said before this. The Rambam has a line, a very important halacha in Shemitan Yovel, where he connects all the major categories of commandments in Mehukothai with each other. They all depend on the Shemitah and Yovel. By the way, uh, another thing just to consider, it makes sense why we read specifically the Tochacha of Vayikra before Shavuot. The entire book has been leading up to something. Beginning with, uh, well, at the beginning of the book of Vayikra, Leviticus, we understand that there's a people count to seven. Whenever anybody is undergoing some sort of ritual purification, whether deathly impurity, he's a, or he's a, a Zav, a Mitzora, a Nida, uh, et cetera, he has, to, he has to undergo seven days of purification. He counts up those seven days. And then the latter half of this book has three series of seven times seven. First, we have the commandment to count the Omer, which isn't just simply count 40 to 49 or 50. The specific commandment twice in the Torah is to count weeks. You have to count, the, like Chazal say, you have to count days and you have to count weeks. Why does it have to be broken up into weeks and make sure to keep track of those weeks? Because each week is a unit of preparation, a whole unit of seven. So first we count the Omer. And then the next parasha, Bahukothai, sorry, Bahar, talks about how we have to count up years in groups of seven, seven groups of seven leading up to the 50th year, which is the special holy year, just like our count of seven times seven days leads up to the 50th day, which is a special holiday. And then the sages told us that the curses, the, the, the repercussions, the consequences of not keeping the, the covenant are, can be categorized into 40 set, 49 klelot. That's how Chazal counted it. And we read in the text of this parasha, we find that indeed the individual punishments are divided into groups of seven. That's the refrain. It's almost a chorus in this week's parasha. I will strike thee, or I'll give it back to you seven times for your sin. So the sages saw that's, ah, that's 49 klelot. This book, therefore, uh, sorry, this particular section, therefore fits this time of year when we are finishing up the counting of the Omer leading up to the 50th day. The, it, it's, it, it seems that this particular section uh, fits this season much more than, for example, the klelot at the end of Devarim, which doesn't have this running theme and vice versa. It wouldn't make sense to read the Levitical curses before the end of the year, before Rosh Hashanah, because it doesn't, the, this, that seven themes appears in the book, but not at that time of the season. So what are, the Rambam says that all these commandments with regards to uh, slaves and ownership of land, those are all in effect when the Shemitah and Yovel are in effect. They all depend on each other. And then when we look at these mitzvot, we find that they do something that's actually we've, something that we've seen before with regards to other commandments. I, I, I recommend you look at these essays to understand what I'm talking about. We find patterns in the Torah. The halacha, the, the laws that, are, that apply to a, a specific person or category are found elsewhere as though it is trying to draw a direct parallel and learn a lesson from them. For example, uh, the Barbano was the first to point out that the commandments that the Nazarite takes upon himself raise him to level of a Kohen. The four categories, he mentioned three, I added a fourth one, it says the Kohen has a special initiative that when, he, when he's initiated into the service, he brings a special sacrifice and the Zira is the opposite of that. He brings his sacrifice when he leaves his, his uh, term of service. And the Nazir grows his hair long the exact way that a Kohen is not supposed to grow his hair long. Yet a Nazir also doesn't go near the dead or drink wine, just like a Kohen. So these halachas transform the Nazir into Kohen. And we have another one explaining how the person, Ir Miklad, is basically like a Kohen Gadol. Uh, a major theme of the Haggadah of Pesach is trying to show that the commandments and laws that govern the consumption of the Korban Pesach which are unique to Korban Pesach alone among all the other consumed sacrifices, uh, are all reflect something that the, that the Kohanim themselves do when they are in the temple. Oh, look, someone's here. So I, I found that there is a pattern in these laws leading up to the Tochan. That is, people, Jewish people, are bidden to keep a Sabbath. We operate at the speed of life, and we have to keep a Sabbath once every seven days. And the land itself is also bidden to keep a Sabbath. That's how the 
Oh, are we still here? We just lost power. Tell me, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me or someone say something. You sure you can hear me? Okay, thumbs up, good. I don't know why, but someone just killed the power on me, but you can still see me. Uh, normally when we lose the power here, the transmission cuts out. So we're, I'm thankful that it has not happened. Hopefully it'll turn the lights back on soon. Uh, where was I? Yes, so the land also is bidden to keep a Sabbath. We are bidden to keep a Sabbath every seven days. The land moves a little bit slower. The land is sort of inanimate or parts of the land are at least vegetative, but they're not, uh, they're tzomeach and domain, but they're not chai. They are not alive. And the land keeps a Sabbath. And not only that, it doesn't just say you keep a Sabbath. It says the land shall keep a Sabbath. How does the land keep a Sabbath? That's by you refraining from doing your work in the field. But either way, we see that the land suddenly is also bidden to keep a Sabbath. Uh, the sixth verse describes how the land is for the yield of the land during the sabbatical year is for everybody to eat. And that, by the way, is reminiscent of the of the, uh, the unique quality of Yamim Tovim. Uh, we learn even before the Jewish people stood in Mount Sinai and received the Torah, they were given the holiday of Pesach and they were told not to do any work on the festival day except that which is Yeh Nefesh. Uh, for for uh, sustenance, for eating purposes, we have a dispensation. Not all of the forbidden later labors that would be forbidden on, let's say, the weekly Sabbath are forbidden on Yom Tov. Next, there's the idea of, that, by the way, is the basis for Bi'ur, which we'll talk about also, God willing, before the next year starts, because it's a big three-way machloketh between the medieval authorities, how exactly one goes about doing that. At Towards the end of the, well, uh, as the crops dwindle, as we eat that which is in the field that from the Shemitah year, it becomes forbidden. And we'll exactly treat that. We'll, God willing, discuss sometime. Uh, next, you have the land has to have the holy 50th year, just like the Israelites count the 50th day, that's a holy day. And then we have the general principle against overcharging. Uh, this is a very interesting one. The, the sages learn laws of overcharging from this idea, uh, just like uh, an evidivri. Uh, it's not when, a, when a, unfortunately, a Jewish man is sold into slavery to pay off his debts or because he can't pay back that which he stole. So it's not an objective value like we have at Arachina after this week's parasha, or it is on the slave markets, how much he's going to work. That's, you have to pay for his labor, basically. So too, when you buy a field, you're, play, you're, pray, you're paying for the yield. Why? Because you're not actually buying the field in perpetuity. Why? In the 23rd verse, it says that you cannot sell land of Israel in perpetuity. God says it's mine, ki li ha'aretz, lo timacher litzmitu, it cannot be sold in perpetuity. What does it mean, by the way, when God says this land is mine, you cannot sell it, you cannot buy it, what do you mean? There's a Jewish owner. The anthropomorphic expression that God is using that he owns the land and you can't have it means that every single parcel of Eretz Yisrael ideally has a Jewish family with its name on it. And... It means that this land belongs to this Jewish family to the exclusion of everybody else. And it always will go back to that family. That's what it means. So too, God says that Jews should not be sold into slavery. Why? Because they are my servants. That is an anthropomorphic expression. We, we can't actually serve God, so to speak. How do we serve God? By keeping the commandments. So too, because we are God's servants, God wants us to be free from any human mastership. And therefore, we cannot be sold in, per into, in perpetuity either. Uh, next, th these three examples show that the land is basically treated like a living human entity. The land keeps the Sabbath. The land has a non-objective value. It's only sold for its production. It's not sold in perpetuity like a Jewish man. Uh, it's forbidden to sell an Israelite to a Gentile. Straight halacha. You're not allowed to sell an Israelite into slavery or indentured servitude to a Gentile, if the Beit Din is forced to sell this guy for whatever reason, can't be sold to a Gentile. So too, although it's not in this week's parsha, it's elsewhere, you cannot sell part of the land of Israel to Gentiles, that's forbidden. And by the way, this shows the irony because here we're talking about Shemitah Yovel, and one of the major rabbinic uh, mechanisms, which has been around for the last few hundred years, which is very questionable, very controversial even to today, is the Heter Mechira, which means they sell the land of Israel in a fictitious sale, much like we sell the chametz, or we shouldn't sell the chametz before Passover. They sell land of Israel to the Gentile so that during the Shemitah year, the commandments of Shemitah will not apply to land. That's at least the hope. It's ironic because 
the you're not supposed to sell land to the to the to the Gentile. And it's exactly from this parasha where we make this connection, just like you don't sell Jews to the Gentile, you do not sell the land of Israel, part of the land of Israel to the Gentile. It's just one of those things. I it, well, we could talk again also about the the unfortunate uh, reasons why we have to use Hetem Rechira, why at least many great rabbis have endorsed Hetem Rechira because they really had no choice in the matter. Rav Schechter has a lot to say about that, uh, but that's also, God willing, we'll talk about that before Shemitah hits. So we don't sell land. Uh, also, most importantly, the land is redeemed. You sell your land or your sometimes your house, uh, you can redeem it. You can immediately go, you can go to the buyer pay off the sale, and then redeem that land, and just bring it back into your possession. And it also says that perhaps the family can do that. If this fellow's had to sell his land and he can't buy it back, so his family should step in and buy it back for him. So too with an Israelite sold into slavery. He can buy his freedom back. He could pay off whatever it is that the master paid to purchase him. Or perhaps his family should step in and buy back his freedom. And in any event, both land and Jewish slaves go free during the Ovel year, the 50th year. That's it. Emancipation, no matter what, everybody goes back. So with all these mitzvot that are unique to Parashat Bahar, we see that the land of Israel is basically treated like a Jewish man, a free Jewish man who is supposed to be keeping the mitzvot. And this is actually quite unique that we, we personify land. I'm, I'm reminded of a song we used to sing in elementary school. They were singing about the Kotel. But really, I think it applies to the entire land of Israel. It says, Yesh avanim im lev shal evan. Uh, sorry, Yesh anashim im lev shal evan. There's some men who have a stone, a heart of stone. Yesh avanim im lev adam. But there's some stones which have the heart of man. This parasha is basically showing us that the land of Israel, even though you could say it's inanimate, is bidden to keep the commandments, just like Jewish people are bidden to keep the commandments. And, I, and this is far beyond a coincidence that the same language would even be used in each individual case. They are mine. They should not be slaves anywhere else. They shall not be sold like slaves. And then God says, The land is mine. It cannot be sold in perpetuity. And then the sages, uh, based on a number of similar verses, say that now you're supposed to live in the land and that's how you worship God. The true keeping of the Torah can only be accomplished in the land of Israel. Uh, we have the classic lesson we learned from King David. Living in the land of Israel is like worshiping God, having a God. And living outside the land of Israel is like worshiping idols, one, or he has no God. So we also should know one last point. Foreign lands can be acquired in perpetuity. We can annex lands. The, the sages have this concept in Gitin and other places that once we have the complete Eretz Israel, we can conquer further lands, take lands of the Gentiles and give extend the holiness of the land of Israel to those places. That becomes part of the land of Israel. So too, we can buy slaves from Gentile stock or accept converts from the Gentiles. And once they come to us, they don't go back. They cannot revert to their former Gentile status. So the land observes commandments, patterned after those that apply to people. And then we get into now this reading, which we're going to do this Shabbat, or which most people did last week. The productivity of the land is the main blessing. Peaceful existence on the land and the land's productivity. The land is cooperating with us in keeping the Torah. We keep the Torah and the land will keep us. And the main themes of the curses is the opposite, that the land ceases to make, uh, uh, become uh, productive and that it becomes inhospitable to us. And the most horrible final curse is exile. And then we get to the, one of the strangest personifications that is twice in the curses, and that is the land will finally have a chance to rest because the, the exile is a punishment for not allowing the land to rest. Uh, we read... The, the prophet Jeremiah was, was uh, admonishing the people before the, before the first destruction that they had to keep the Torah, emancipate their slaves, let the slaves go, let the land rest, and they weren't doing that. So then all the Jewish people were taken away as slaves to the Babylonians, and even those who were left were meant to work for the Babylonians, and the land is finally given a chance to rest. Now, this idea, which Rashi mentions, by the way, calculating how long the Babylonian exile lasted in order to allow the land to catch up on all the missing Shemitah years, uh, that connection is made explicitly at the end of the book of Chronicles. The Torah says the land will have a chance to rest. 
And Yirmiyahu says a few times, the land will have a 70-year exile. You'll be taken away 70 years of Babylon or Babylonia. And then at the end of Divrayamim, we have this connection that that Babylonian exile was to make up for the missing Shemitot and Yovlot that uh, were described here at the end of Book of Leviticus. And that's, that, that, is a, that is, I think, the single strongest lesson that we could take away from this, that perhaps we can now look at this and say, well, the Babylonian exile lasted a certain amount of time. They knew how long to calculate that. That made up for all the missing Shemitah years, because Shemitah, at least according to the way the Rambam and others understand it, was a biblical commandment the entire, well, most of the first temple time. It stopped being a commandment some way through the first temple times. But in second temple times, the Shemitah only existed as a rabbinic enactment. And we now see that, unfortunately, the, the Khurban start, the Khurban happened approximately 1951 years ago, or 52 years ago, depending on how you calculate it. And it's been a while. Obviously, we haven't missed that many Shemitah years in the Second Temple times. So how, what, what's going on? Why hasn't, why hasn't, why haven't we gone back to having Temple times? Why hasn't the exile come to a complete end, finally? Uh, and I like to quote the Rav here. He, he mentions the Gemara in, in Yoma and Reish Lakish, blaming the Babylonians, a full two centuries after the destruction of the Second Temple, the Babylonians, it was their fault. They had seven centuries and more to come back to the land of Israel. Uh, that, that was the entire Second Temple time, to come back and strengthen uh, the land, to come back and strengthen the Jewish community, and they didn't. There's a, there's a few psukim, there's a few midrashim that describe why that would have happened. They could have made it happen at any moment, and we're still in that situation. Right now, it is in our hands to bring the redemption. The, the land has already had enough Shemitah years. We just have to bring it now. We have to bring our fellow Jews from the, from the Chutz Laretz. Those of us who are here have to learn to keep the Torah properly and to help others keep the Torah. How are you supposed to keep the Torah if you don't even study what you're supposed to, what you're supposed to keep? It, Shemitah is very hard to keep because very few people have practical experience with it. And many of these halachot, we don't have indentured servitude nowadays uh, certainly not Evid Kanani, and we don't have Evid Ivri, that hasn't been around, but there are many other commandments which we can keep and which we just ignore. Most importantly, commandments regarding the temple and the sacrifices. That is what God wants of us, and it is essential. If we learn to keep the commandments, we will learn, uh, we will, God willing, merit to see these blessings also come true. Uh, and now take any questions. If anybody had anything, last time there was uh, like two questions at the end, I think. Uh, Yoshua, you have one? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. How old, how old, how old is the minhag of, uh, of reading the Tohaka, uh fast and quietly? So I, I don't know. I was looking into, for example, the other readings that the sages say we should have. For example, the Mishnah already says that we are to read what's known as the four parashiyoth. And it seems that those are early second temple times. I don't have all the, all the information here. Perhaps maybe the Rav has something to say about that. Or uh, I think Gavriel was looking into this. There were some other fellows in the Israeli section, some fellows I'm in contact with who are trying to find it. But it seems to be a very, very old practice. And that was already done at least in Second Temple times. The, the, there is the Sefer HaChinuch. I, I wrote an essay how it, I bring the, the, the indications against what he says, that the reading of Zachor or Shkalim, that which we read Shkalim, uh, right before Rosh Chodesh Adar or on the Shabbos, that is Rosh Chodesh Adar, is a zecher to the fact that we would used to contribute the Shkalim to the temple at, at that time. But that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems from the Mishnah, you could, you could see this, that reading Shkalim is the announcement, was our reading of Shkalim is and was the announcement that the Mishnah describes uh, telling people, donate your half shekels to the temple. So that was from temple times. That was telling people to do this. I don't know exactly when. I don't think for many of these things we know exactly when. But uh, yeah, that's, that's as much as I know. Um, maybe I didn't make my question clear enough. Uh, the, the question was about the, the minag of, of reading the Torah at high speed. And, oh, and at high speed? Oh. oh. How old is that? Oh, probably not. I don't know. But it's, it's, it's certainly not something that you could find in the Gemara. Uh, the Ramba makes no mention of such a thing. I have to see if perhaps I don't, I don't even think it's right, by the way. I know that, that there was, uh, I saw arguments that it's actually not correct. Like it should be read like any other reading. It should not be any different than anything. So I'd have to look into that. Yeah, I, 
I must, I must, yep. agree, I must agree with you, Rav, Avi. Oh, good. Thanks for agreeing. <laughs> it's not difficult to agree with everything, almost everything that you say. Baruch Hashem. Um, I've always thought that it's a very strange and uh, to me it's quite obviously an incorrect practice to read to read anything that Hazal tell us we are supposed to read in public. The aim, obviously, is that the public hear it. And they hear it in such a manner that they can comprehend it. So it has to be read relatively slowly. When you dictate or read a text to a, to a tzibur, um, and in those days it didn't necessarily almost certainly did, did not have a written text in front of them. So they had to, had to hear what was being read by the, the person reading from the Torah. When you read a text to, a, to an audience, if you want them to take it in, you have to read it slowly. And on top of that, there's a Targum. And the purpose of reading the Torah is Tamut Torah Barabim. It's public Torah study. And the aim is that people understand what's being read. If you read it quickly and uh, very quietly, you're defeating the purpose, and I don't think you're being the came the Miswa. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, send in questions, comments. Uh, thank I, you for the I would just like, I would just like to say, Hazaku Baruch, Yashir, Kohachalo Raitha, a very informative, interesting shiur, not surprising. Uh, and we look forward to uh, more shiori. Uh, the, the subject that you mentioned about Shemitah, there are many points to do with Shemitah that we will have to cover. And we look forward to that, that you uh, will be playing your part in that. Thank you. Be well. Shalom, shalom. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Haim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one, if you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Israel, or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org. If you are inspired by Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to get involved in Torah Eretzishol activities in your local area, please fill out the relevant form by going to the link which appears on the screen.